there may still be a couple people uh, on their way, but we'll go ahead and get started. So, um, see, I may need to select a different window here. Not just you can get to, if you want to go forward to 64. So. Uh, that's not a bad thing. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Okay. I need to get to go here. I'm sorry. There you go. Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> this should be. Um, at least in, in some degree, a little bit of review for osteopathic approach to the history and physical. Um, part of where this came out of, um, in the hospital here, we've got a utilization committee that reviews how good we are in actually incorporating uh, some of the osteopathic elements into our physical exam. And, and well, we, we were, haven't been doing very well. So we thought maybe a review would be worthwhile. Um, so just some basic points that uh, I'll try and cover here. Um, you know, you got to go back to the osteopathic tenants. Otherwise, doing the osteopathic exam <clears throat> doesn't really mean much. Um, and I think most of the rest of this is going to be relatively self-explanatory. But some definitions for somatic dysfunction, uh, components of your osteopathic exam, um, how to appropriately document it, because I think that that's probably a bigger uh, issue, is that I think a lot of us are doing this sort of exam and don't really know how to write it down so that it, it shows up. Um, and then, again, a reminder about acute versus chronic tissue texture findings, and then um, some basic things that we can do on initial uh, hospital treatment. Um, so, osteopathic tenants. Uh, human body is a dynamic unit of function. We've got self-regulatory mechanisms that are self-healing in nature, structure and function being interrelated, and then rational treatment based on these principles. Uh, you know, the reason we give antibiotics is to kill microbes, but really we're still relying on the fact that the body can recover from that chemical and then it can put itself back together after we've killed off those microbes. So even when you think about things that are not that may be necessarily traditionally osteopathic in nature, these, these tenets still apply. Um, and again, kind of coming back to this physical exam, since a lot of what osteopathy is about is hands-on. Um, basically, the neuromusculoskeletal structure exam should just be part of what you're already doing. Um, you know, with the standard of care here is in quotes because really as either osteopathic students or physicians, this should be our standard of care is including this. So, physical exam, shouldn't really be anything out of the ordinary. I, I hope nobody's trying this. Um, <clears throat> so, when we're, when we're palpating, when we're, when we're actually hands-on with our patients, what are we finding? Um, so, this is the de definition of somatic dysfunction. Impaired or altered function of related components in the somatic system. I happen to like it laid out a little bit better this way. This is the mnemonic that we probably heard at some point during first and second year, the uh, Sam Volan mnemonic. Um, and when we talk about what we're dealing with in the hospitalized patient, um, the exam that we're really going to focus on is going to focus on the skeletal, arthroidal, and uh, muscular and fascial components, so the, the first half of this. Um, again, kind of covering basics here. There are several body regions. When, when we approach osteopathy in the classroom, a lot of times we talk about, hey, you've got to examine this patient from head to toe. You've got to look at everything that's possibly wrong. In the hospital setting, we're really looking at the, le the places of interest. Where's, where's the biggest yield? Because assuming that you're going to do osteopathic treatment to help this person, they're not going to tolerate treating every little thing in their entire body. They're going to tolerate just a little bit, a focused exam. So really, you need to focus on the areas where you get the, uh, the largest effect. So first component, must, must, must actually have a visual inspection. Um, when we're talking about what you're looking at in the physical exam for uh, hospitalized patients, what you're looking for usually are uh, you know, obvious asymmetries. You know, don't, don't miss an arrow through the chest, please. Um, you're looking at things like, uh, you know, a patient who, you, as you're, you're talking with them, you're standing on their left side, for example, and they, and to look at you, instead of turning their head, they 
turn their whole body. You know, there's an obvious problem with turning their neck. Um, second element is that you need to do this examination in at least two positions if you possibly can. Um, and when you're talking about the documentation aspect, you need to explain why or why not in terms of what you're doing. Um, and really, you know, the actual criteria when you talk about what you document Level in your HEP. Level two Thomas to the ER. Level two Thomas to the ER. When you talk about what you're documenting in your HMP and it then translating in the ability to actually perform OMT and your attending being able to bill for that, you really should be looking at somatic dysfunction anywhere. It is helpful, however, if you do talk about its relationship to the primary disease process. Um, again, uh, some more of the foundational stuff, your, your TART findings, tissue texture changes, asymmetry, restricted motion, tenderness. Um, again, the asymmetry and restricted motion are things that you can, at least in some sense, pick up just when you look at the patient. But then when you palpate, you should be able to define those a little bit better. Um, so this is uh, the, the region focus. How do you choose where it is you're going to actually spend your time and energy? Um, there's uh, this five models approach that has uh, <coughs> part of the foundations of medicine, uh, uh, <coughs> edition three, that kind of goes through some of this in more detail. Um, Today, um, you know, I don't think we need to focus on a lot of it. Really what's significant, well, it looks like my, uh, my fading has been changed moving from a PC to a Mac here. Um, that was supposed to fade the uh, bottom portion of the screen, the uh, metabolic energy and behavioral. When we talk about our basic exam in the hospitalized patient, biomechanical, respiratory, circulatory, and the neurologic model. Those are the things that you're really going to get a lot of bang for your buck when you're talking about examining them. Um, so uh, postural muscles, essentially what this really focuses on is where's the chief complaint? I'm short of breath. Well, okay. So what are the things that are directly physically related to that complaint? Um, I have belly pain. What, what parts of the body are physically directly related to that complaint? Respiratory circulatory model, um, you know, this is going back to the idea of the rule of artery is supreme. Uh, <clears throat> you don't have good oxygenation, you don't have good ventilation, uh, you don't have actual adequate tissue perfusion going to <clears throat> the, uh, you know, the area that's, that's the primary complaint. These, these are all issues. Um, and again, a lot of the things we see in the hospital, acute exacerbation of COPD, pneumonia, um, these things are directly related to the respiratory system. Heart failure, you know, MI, these are directly related to the circulatory system. There should be findings. And then the other thing that we probably look at the most when we think about the osteopathic exam is in the neurologic model because we deal with sympathetics and parasympathetics all the time. This is one of the, this is one of the areas that you're really going to get a lot of benefit from and that you can probably do the most good for your patient when you're looking at these. So here's the reminder of that. The autonomic nervous system. It's everywhere. Um, and so we should have a basic idea, regardless of what patient we're looking at, which part of the spine is going to be the most, most likely to have findings. Um, you know, you look at the sympathetic nervous system, of course, our, our most obvious change here that we all know about is we're looking between T1 and L2. I think the piece that we often forget about here are the cervical chain ganglia. Um, and these don't necessarily contribute to, to everything that we see on a daily basis, but it does mean that the, the cervical spine is a good place to go looking as a common source of somatic dysfunction. Um, and then, again, based on you know what the chief complaint is, what organ system is involved, I should tell you how high or low. Now, I'm not saying that we all need to necessarily have this whole thing memorized. I mean, I still look this thing up when I need it. But we should have a general idea of as we are higher in the body, we need to be higher in the spine and on down. Uh, the other thing to look at that, that I think is, is very useful are then some of these other ganglia, the, the uh, celiac ganglia, 
and the mesenteric ganglia uh, further down the chains there. Um, <clears throat> You know, when we're talking about a chief complaint that has something to do with the abdominal cavity, good place to go looking for sympathetic um, uh, dysfunction. So, again, brief reminder, in words instead of pictures, sympathetic nervous system, looking at T1 through L2. And this is, again, a little bit of a reminder that these things are easy to treat. You know, if you are conducting an HMP, where you're examining the patient while you're talking to them, as you're sitting at the bedside asking them more questions, you can have your hand underneath the rib, you can be doing rib raising, you can do paraspinal inhibition. It's a very easy thing to add to what you're already doing. Um, when you're talking about making this a seamless part of your HMP, these are simple things that you can add. Um, Parasympathetics, again, there's the, really only the two major players, the vagus and the sacrum. There's two places to go. Um, don't forget that the vagus nerve has some effects that come from C1, C2, good places to look. Again, the neck, the neck, the neck. A um, couple of different things you can do for treatment there. Um, again, really comes down to inhibition. is the, the single simplest thing to do as part of your HMP. Um, I have said, you know, said a couple of times, you know, different examples. Um, I keep coming back to the respiratory model. Um, talk about the thoracics, T1 through T6. Um, cervical region, you know, again, you're talking about the respiratory model. T3, 4, 5, keep the diaphragm alive. I think that's something most of us have heard at some point. Again, neck is, is a good place to be looking. Um, and then, of course, when we're talking about the respiratory system, the ribs are something that is a physical component directly related to a chief complaint a lot of times. So, we have to document everything. Um, I, I hope most of us aren't quite feeling like a biological tech support specialist, but, you know, some days. Um, so, again, this is kind of going back over the things that I just said, because they're important. Um, where a lot of this comes from is your attending's ability to bill for any OMT that you do. And secondly, you know, if you're at an osteopathic institution, there are requirements that you do an osteopathic examination on a certain number of your patients. And these are the criteria that they look at to say, did this HMP do that job? So, looking at whether the exam was performed or contraindications documented. This is an example of how you would actually state a contraindication. Patients vented, I'm really only gonna look at them in that supine position, I'm not gonna try and roll them around, have them sit up, any of these kind of things, they're probably you know, not with it. You need to give an explanation, and really, this is pretty straightforward and simple. If there's a reason you can't do it, you just need to state it. Um, going back to our visual inspection of asymmetry, this is about the obvious. Um, you know, uh, the simplest thing that you can that you can state about a patient is no gross asymmetries noted on visual ins inspection. But what you really should be looking for, you know, especially in a lot of the, the patients that we see around around here in Kirksville, you know, look for things like you know missing fingers. We have a lot of people who've had amputations. Um, look for the patient that, that won't turn one direction. Look for the patient um, that even as they're laying flat in bed, one of their shoulders is cranked way forward. Um, just, just making sure you, you're catching the big things. And if there's not something clearly obvious, that is a good statement. No gross asymmetries noted on visual inspection. Um, so our soft tissue changes is another key element of our documentation here. Um, this should be a review from first and second year when we first started palpating. Um, so acute changes. When you're dictating your HMP, a lot of times we have a tendency to say, you know, there's acute tissue texture changes in such and such region. It's helpful if you can actually say there are acute tissue texture changes noted based, or, uh, you know, on uh, warmth in the area or, erythema in the overlying tissue. Something along these lines that, that 
says, hey, yeah, I actually am calling this acute for a reason. Um, and then again, the same information talking about chronic changes. The hospitalized patient. Um, you know, we all have our favorite patients. The pa patients that we've seen many, many times, even if we're only in our, you know, will this be our fifth month of rotations? And we've already seen them three times. Um, these patients are likely to have those chronic changes. You talk about your COPD ears. That same, those same reasons we talked about for the lungs a minute ago, you should expect to find these kinds of things in those patients with chronic diseases. Um, and I think that that's probably got a lot to do with what we are, are talking about when we say let's do an accurate HMP. We know before we really get very far along the road what we're expecting to find. You just need to include it in what you're documenting. And so then motion testing of the regions. I think what a lot of times we get hung up on is, you know, oh, I need a triplanar diagnosis. The bridge clearly has a rotated right preference here. But that's really all you need to say is, you know, I'm looking at the thoracic spine. T4 through 7 has a preference for rotation to the right. It's a group curve. That's enough to meet the requirements for your documentation. And if you call it a group curve, you're even giving yourself enough information that when you go on and actually choose to do some OMT as part of your exam, you've documented a specific somatic dysfunction. You've covered all the bases with that. So, again, as I've been saying all along, this is not about adding something to what you're having to do. This is, this is taking information that you should already be gathering in your HMP and turning it into something meaningful um, in, uh, in your exam. So, when you talk about the HMP process, there are a couple things that should automatically be happening. In most patients, you should be listening to the posterior lung fields. So, if you're having the patient sit up, Perfect opportunity, as you are, even as you are listening, you can listen at, at, at each of the posts, and while you're doing that, your hand goes down the back of the spine. And I also noted here, quick screens that are the best to focus in on one particular area. As they're sitting up in that position, just run your hands down their spine with just a little bit of pressure. You get your skin drag, you get your red reflex all there together, and as you're listening to their lungs, you can say, oh, yeah, I... Note an area here that has a long, uh, a lasting red reflex, and I have this other area here that stayed pale the whole time. You can include that as part of your osteopathic exam. It also helps you when you then say, hey, I want to motion test something specifically. You know, it's, it's not that hard, especially when you talk about four listening posts. Listen to the first two while you're doing your, your screen. Second two, you can actually push on some specific areas and see what their preferences are. Um, the other great opportunity to get your second position is when you're trying to do that full body skin exam. A lot of times the easiest way to do that is to have the patient roll on their side, lateral recumbent position. Um, also, what we're doing, everybody's favorite, the DRE. Um, patients rolled up on their side. Easy opportunity to use one hand to go down the length of the spine, and you really have a screen for everything from T1 to L5. Make sure you do that before the regular. Yeah, yeah, that's probably a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So the hospital patients that you're actually going to do OMT on, the indications are pretty simple. If you've done a good job in documenting your osteopathic findings as you've been going through the HMP, you have already documented indications for performing OMT as part of your plan. Um, you're documenting somatic dysfunction of some kind. Um, you should be documenting any pain that they're talking about. Um, restricted range of motion was part of what we discussed when we said let's talk about you know motion preferences, visual inspections of asymmetry. We're covering all these things. Um, and then there are specific indications for atelectasis, pneumonia, um, essentially bowel dysfunction, um, autonomic dysfunction. There's a, a bunch of these things that are really easy to document and occur in a large number, if not all, of our patients. So there are a few contraindications, you know, the obligatory slide for that. Um, I actually did go back into the literature and start looking for these um, to see what documentation there is. The actual level of evidence is pretty poor on most of these. They're like, 
one and two example cases of problems, and most of the problems occur not with the osteopathic physicians. Um, but the, the uh, contraindications as they are is basically in cancer, stay away from the actual site of it, no lymphatic pumps, uh, bone disorders like osteoporosis and RA, no HPLA, careful with your direct techniques, and then vertebral artery disease I think is the one that kind of got hammered into our heads during first year of medical school. Uh, no HVLA, and again, caution with the direct techniques. So, again, I got to go back to, this is something that shouldn't be taking you extra time. This is something that should be not uncomfortable for you as you're doing it. Um, now, not every patient necessarily needs to have OMT as part of their physical exam, but if you're standing there talking, just trying to get more information, there is no reason why you can't be incorporating some basic OMT into what you're doing. You raise that bed up, move the tubes and lines out of the place, and you help that patient feel a little bit better a lot of times just with that physical contact. Uh, the paraspinal inhibition that I've mentioned several times already is probably one of the easiest things to incorporate <clears throat> and really does help a lot of sick patients because there is often a sympathetic overdrive component uh, when we talk about the body's response to disease. And then when you have moved everything around so that you're performing this comfortably, put it all back. Just common courtesy sorts of things. Um, the last thing you want is a nurse who, need, who, you know, who hates your presence in the room and makes your life miserable. Um, and then again, what's the point of treating? We should all have a basic idea of this, but it's, it's really very simple things. Correction of dysfunctions, uh, autonomic balance, and then I think probably the easiest thing to measure when we're talking about doing a simple exam like this is look at the patient's pain. Have you made a difference in that? Um, now you can't always, and, and we have plenty of patients that need something other than OMP to control their pain, but there's lots of times when you can do something non-pharmacologic. Um, you know, I know in the middle of the night that I, as an intern, I was usually not really interested in spending a lot of extra effort, but on the patients where you feel like you've tried lots of different things, a lot of times just your presence in the room for a few minutes to perform some basic OMT can do more good than anything else you've done. They've seen the doctor, they feel better. So, um, again, another thing that I've mentioned before is that how much OMT you do really does depend on the acuteness of the patient. <clears throat> Nobody should be trying to pop the back of a 70-year-old osteoporotic woman. Just a bad idea. Um, somebody who's getting ready to go to observation or, or somebody who they're, that's, that's their destination as you're doing the HMP, that patient can probably tolerate a little bit more aggressive therapy. They, they can probably do better with more OMM. Um, so just be conscious of what the patient can tolerate. Um, a lot of the energies in the acute ill or the aseptic patient is going to fighting the disease process. And when you do OMM, you're requiring a lot of the body's resources to actually respond to the treatment that you're doing. So you've got to meter your dosage. <coughs> so again, back to the old documentation thing. Um, <coughs> and this has a lot to do with your attending physician's ability to be able to get paid since, you know, everything that you do is built through their name. Um, when you are finishing your list of diagnoses that for Dr. Greider is already 27 items long, um, add a couple more. You've got somatic dysfunctions in the specific regions that you've examined. You can include those, and you should include those, uh, particularly if you then go on and actually do some OMM. Um, the other element is that as part of your plan, you actually need to state. OMT was performed based on your physical exam as you've done it right then. Um, if you don't have a documentation that basically says the reason for doing this procedure is what we found in exam, it doesn't really hold up um, in terms of uh, the documentation and, and the billing for that. Um, <clears throat> it is also helpful to make a mention specifically of, you know, hey, did I make a change? Did I not make a change? Um, and in a few cases, you can actually solve the problem right then and there. Or you might be able to solve one of their tertiary complaints 
and that makes everything better. Um, <clears throat> now, I do have to acknowledge that we all have our least favorite parts of the physical exam. Um, for a few of us here, that may be the, the idea of doing OMM on the hospitalized patient. That may be the most terrifying thing you've ever heard of. In that case, that's why you need to be able to document for consult as well. Uh, now, for students who are doing their HUP, if you think that a patient would benefit from OMM, your document is not an official document, so you can say, consider an OMM consult, or this patient may benefit from, from OMT seeing this patient while they're in the hospital, or from further OMT therapy, something along those lines. That's a good way to communicate to your attending that you found something you think would benefit. For residents and interns, <laughs> if you use the word consider or recommend, <coughs> uh, or recommend the, uh, the, the attending is likely to not be happy with you, and the hospitals in this hospital will definitely be unhappy with you. Um, they want you to either include it as part of your plan or not. And in the middle of the night, we don't really do consults because that's supposed to be attending to attending. So it's an important thing to check out with, your, uh, with either the attending that, <coughs> that next morning or to let the senior resident know. So a couple of acknowledgments and references there. So <coughs> I've kind of kept this relatively basic, tried to cover uh, the points that I think are relevant to all of us and just remind us of things that we should probably already know. <coughs> yep, you can go now. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Does anybody have any questions on um, oh, what we've got over here? All right. Well, <clears throat> in that case, here's the uh, obligatory picture of my new baby from Halloween. So um, I think that that's probably all we've got to cover today. I've spoken faster than I thought I would. So um, enjoy the rest of your lunch hour. Thank you.